Yana, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful honor and a privilege to spend some time with you on this topic of artificial intelligence. Now, if I ask 10 of you, what is artificial intelligence? I will get 10 different views because we have so many different uh, kind of messages coming our way from Hollywood, um, all the way through the popular press, from chat GPT and so forth. So what I want to cover today is just to demystify what is AI, but I also want to make it practical. When is a tool an AI tool? And of course, the, the elephant in the, in the room, what about our jobs? And Mr. Daniels already touched on some of this and uh, two of his comments I, I really liked. Uh, the one is shifting from number crunches to trusted advisors. And the fact that, and this is hugely important, that AI will not replace the relationships that you have with your colleagues and clients. Over the last year, since the release of ChatGPT, which was on the 30th of November last year, I've seen people move from one end of a spectrum to another when it comes to how we view AI, whether we embrace it and whether we fear it. Um, on the one hand, typically when I deal with clients and when I speak at conferences, people were very pessimistic, very fearful. Uh, they foresaw a dystopian future. And again, it's, it's mainly due to Hollywood and to the popular press. We think of Terminator and other movies. But what I've seen over the last year is rather than finding a balanced view is that a lot of people I speak with have gone to the total opposite side. Total positivity, very excited. AI can result in a utopian world and we can fix everything with AI. And also now everyone is an AI expert as well, it seems to me. A lot of the work I do with clients when I consult with them and we look at their automation or AI strategies is about demystifying what it is. Studies show globally that about 80% of senior business leaders still do not understand this technology. And that is a big problem. It's the most powerful technology we've ever created, even though it's not nearly as powerful as Hollywood would like us to think. Implementing AI will have a massive impact on how your organization works, how you interact with your clients and so forth. So we can no longer just outsource AI initiatives to what I call the dark corners of the IT department. Of course, we need the IT people, the, the technical people, the machine learning engineers and the like. But AI and related initiatives should 100% sit with the board, with the execs, with the C-suite, because they need to make decisions that make sense. But they also need an idea of what will this do to our business, to how um, we recruit to how we manage the life cycle of our employees, to how we compete. The topic of responsible AI in the um, lack of a regulatory framework, which I'll touch on, is a huge topic. We've got three polls because we also would love to hear what our attendees think. So we will call up those polls uh, through my presentation. Uh, and so please look out for them. But I want to start off with a story. Um, it's a, 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 something that happened to me in the last year. And I think it really brings home a point I want to make. One of the key things I would love for you to, to have from this conversation. About a year ago, one of our large hospital groups asked me to come and help them to automate the front desk of their hospitals. Now, in any business, your very administrative kind of tasks, your admin reporting kind of tasks are very automatable. We think here of, of something like robotic process automation or RPA. These days, we speak a lot about intelligent automation, where we bring in more AI algorithms into automating business processes. This hospital group, one of our largest, if I remember correctly, about 50 or 60 hospitals nationwide. Now, you know when you go to the hospital, or even when you go to a doctor's room, sometimes even though you were there a week, a month, three months ago, you still have to fill in the same forms again, or so it seems. And it's very manual, it's handwritten. It's not like you get an iPad and they capture your information digitally so that they can keep on using it. So the front desk of a hospital is a huge candidate for automation. So I walked into this boardroom and a lot of these senior execs from this hospital group were in the room. On all three sides, the walls were whiteboards and they were full of scribblies and mind maps and the like. This executive team, you can see, have done a lot of work and thinking 
on what automation can benefit them in and how they can automate these front desk kind of roles. I'm always worried when the main goal of automation is replacing people. In the consulting world, we often speak about FTE reduction, full-time equivalence, because I think we don't always have the guts to talk about people. And we make spreadsheet decisions as consultants often on who we can get rid of because we're going to automate. But I've seen so many automation initiatives go wrong because here, here is the common sense thing we need to keep in mind. You should automate the right things for the right reasons and in the right way. I then told these uh, number of execs in this room that I am not able to help them. And they asked me why. And again, remember, they came from this AI conference, apparently. They were very excited about AI and automation. They were now going to AI everything in their business. That's also something I hear from execs a lot. And then when I interrogate them, what do you mean? They often speak about automation and not AI, which I will explain. And they also think, again, remember, oh, chat GPT bring us from the one end of the spectrum to the other where we are super excited and it's going to fix all of our problems in our businesses and um, we need AI. Now, there's a lot of things AI can't do. It cannot replace experience. And the previous speaker also referred to that. And I think for us, and especially in this domain from, from an accounting point of view, finding that balance between what robots and automation algorithms can do that we shouldn't really be doing but what are the things that only humans can do and that only experienced people can do, which you cannot automate at this stage? So I, I said to them, I can't help you for two reasons. Number one, whenever we speak about automation, obviously we're thinking about job losses. So if you want to take people in your organization on the journey with you, you have to include them from the very start. No matter how smart you think your change management initiative is, whether you have little posters in the toilets or at the coffee area and so forth, I often think that you know people will take their pitchforks and storm the castle gates if there's an initiative that makes them think, rightly or wrongly, that they might lose their jobs. So that's the first reason. You have to take people with you on this journey. But the most important reason why I said I couldn't help them is that there's information there's knowledge and there's experience in the heads of these people whose jobs you want to automate. And at an executive level in the business, often we don't really have a clue what people are doing on the ground level. That's why I love that TV series, um, Undercover Boss. And you might remember it. They, they take the CEO and they will disguise him or her and let them work on the factory floor or just with the normal people and normally they get tremendous insights in what's really happening in their business because they are typically so many layers above where the real work is happening. They then gave me permission, this hospital group, to spend some time with some of these administrator, uh, administrators. We had a very relaxed coffee. We were speaking about some of their challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. And some of their challenges we could fix through technology. So for instance, they and, and you will find this in a lot of work that we do and that our people do. They had to go to one system to find something, maybe a, a, a patient record, had to copy and paste the patient number into another system, actually find the record, then go to another system, and so forth, and so forth. Those kind of interactions are fairly easily automatable. We can bring all that data together in one view, in one screen to help that administrator. But this is going to sound so silly, and it's such an important lesson, or what was for me. Apart from some of these challenges around different systems and so forth, and this was their head office, which is their main hospital here in Johannesburg. They said that their biggest problem is that the printer is too far from them. And I asked them about it. And they said that with every patient interaction, anyone who walks into the hospital, we have to go to the printer on average three times. And the printer was too far from them. So my advice to this exec team was just bring the printer closer. It sounds stupid. And uh, I call it the bring the printer closer moment. And I often share this with customers. So before you jump on this AI and automation bandwagon, and, and we have to look at it from a being competitive point of view, look for those common sense solutions. 
that's not nearly anything to do with AI automation or digital technologies. It's just bringing the printer closer. You can't automate experience, as I said. What you also can't automate is a toxic work environment, bad leadership, people who don't understand the work that they're doing, people who need training, people who fear for the future in the world of automation. And the way I explain it to people is often I draw two circles. The inner circle is what I call the smart technology ecosystem because AI is, as I'm sure many of you know, not one thing. AI is really a term that encompasses a number of technologies. We call it smart technologies or thinking technologies or intelligence, um, computer intelligence. But the outer circle is the reason why AI and automation initiatives go wrong. And in that circle, I normally write words like change management, organizational design, leadership, training, how we recruit, how we do business responsibly, uh, how we use our data, and so forth, and so forth. Because we normally don't have a multidisciplinary group involved in these initiatives. Again, it's just the, the IT people. But in a world where technology will impact us so greatly, we do need a core group that's multidisciplinary. We need the smart IT people, but we also need legal because the potential legal ramifications and the biases in our data sets and the wrong decisions that AI can make is something we must consider. We need organizational design people to help us think, if we start on an AI journey now, what will our business look like in a year or in five years from now? What kind of talent do we need to look for? Talent that we maybe never had a need for. What do we do with the people in our business whose jobs are very automatable? So definitely legal, organizational design, the HR team definitely, and others. We need people from different ethnicities. We need people from different age groups and obviously multi-gender. Let me give you an example. I worked with one of my banking clients a few months back and they said, can you write an algorithm I think they've got about 600,000 customers, one of our local banks. And can you write an algorithm that identifies potential family units within our client data set? Because they were looking at promoting a uh, educational product to parents. And this is where biases come in, because we all have biases. It's not, there's nothing wrong with it, as long as we realize that we do have them and that we work with people who see things differently than us and who are different from us to get a balanced view. So my view, from my worldview point of view of a family, is a man and a woman, maybe with children. But then I need a colleague who says, but what about a same-sex relationship? Or what about a single parent? Or what about a couple who chose not to have children or people who cannot have children? And so forth, and so forth. So please, Make sure it's not just the techies or just one or two people with a specific worldview. Because the algorithm I would have written from my worldview would exclude so many people. I need my colleagues and a trusted team relationship to say, remember that I see things differently. When it comes to biases in our data sets, how we use AI, especially from a gender point of view and especially from an ethnicity point of view, we have major problems. So to always remember, Bring the printer closer. What is that common sense approach that might not even nearly be AI or digital technologies that can sort out some of your business problems? So let's get to the first poll before I move on to the other points. I wanna ask you, what is your view of AI technologies? And remember what I said, people often fall on this um, spectrum, either very negative about it, fearful about it, or in this chat GPT era, very, very positive about it. And both those extremes are wrong. We need to find a balance somewhere in the middle. So look at some of the options, and I think it's coming onto the screen now. What is your view of AI technologies? I don't know much about it. I think most people might even answer that. I think it's amazing and we can all use it. I think it's dangerous and we should be very careful. And we've got two more polls and at the end, before I conclude, we're just going to look through some of those results. So as I continue, look at the poll uh, questions. It's anonymous. Please give your answer. Um, I would be surprised if the, the trend in the, in the data that we see is different from what I see in all the conferences that I speak at. 
So bring the printer closer. Let's think about the evolution of technology. And I will shortly come to a point of explaining what is AI really in layman's terms. As human beings, we have been tool makers for thousands of years. From a, and, and I know people have different views on evolution, but from an evolutionary point of view, for the last 50 to 80,000 years, it seems that, and especially since we as Homo sapiens started walking upright, we were able to use our hands and especially our thumbs to fashion the world around it. And if you have a smartphone, you still use your thumbs a lot to type in that phone while you should be watching the traffic or focus in the meeting. Well, hopefully you're not doing it while I'm speaking, but we are tool makers. We fashion the world around us and the tools we make are neutral. So think of a flint or a, or a knife. I can kill an animal to feed my family, or I can use that same instrument and kill my neighbor in a dispute. The tool is not what is responsible for it. It's how I, as a human, use the tool. And artificial intelligence and digital technologies is the same. It is fundamentally neutral. It's how we use it. And that's where ethics and the philosophy of technology comes in. And that's where a regulatory framework is needed all across the world. But here's the difference. You've heard a lot about generative AI, and that is ChatGPT, or it could be Google's BARD and other tools. We hear a lot about large language models. It's the first time in human history that the tools we create are able to create their own tools. And that applies predominantly from an algorithm point of view at the moment. But I can write a piece of code for a software system to perform a certain task. It could, for instance, be an automated decisioning system when it comes to credit scoring, as an example, or access to healthcare, which is quite scary. And those automated decisioning systems are becoming more and more widely used in our world. But what if that algorithm can now create its own code, fix itself, make itself better to a point where we lose track of and control over what we call the source code? What if that switch it off button metaphorically disappears? And that, that brings us to some of these fearful and, and quite honestly, some realistic views about the future of AI. So we're living in an era for the first time in human history where we can create tools that, and the tools can create tools by themselves. We will also start seeing it more and more in what we call the cyber physical world, if you think of 3D printing, where it's not just algorithms creating algorithms, but where algorithms can create and manage physical objects. We already have um, autonomous drones. You know, in the, in the Ukraine, they reckon it's the first time in human history where warfare is conduct, being conducted by algorithms. You would typically have a drone that would, through facial recognition, for instance, recognize that is a, the enemy or a terrorist, for instance. And it will send that analysis back to a human commander. And that human will then make the decision to fire that missile and kill that person. In the Ukraine at the moment, and it will most likely spread across the world more and more, we have algorithms that make the kill decision. Based on how it was programmed, algorithms make mistakes like humans. Algorithms can also misfire or kill the wrong person like humans. But it brings us to a massively ethical topic because obviously it's horrible if a human kills a human, but it could be out of self-defense, for instance. But now it's a machine that kills a human. I think we will see more and more of that happening again, the ethics of how much do we allow technology to do on our behalf and how much control do we want to lose? Before I get to the next poll and also really bringing it back to what is AI really, I want to give you a sense of where the future of AI is going. And this is a bit of a, a scary conversation. And it's not about scaremongering, but I also think that a lot of us, and especially those working in the field, are asleep at the wheel. You know, we, most of the conferences I attend, most of the books I read are about the technical aspects of AI technologies. And those things are relevant. It's super exciting. But you will not easily find a conference or a talk or a book on the human aspect of AI. What will AI do to humans? Not just from a potential job displacement point of view, but even when it comes to the very nature of being human. Again, quickly back to some evolutionary history. 
about 80 or so thousand years ago, we as Homo sapiens lived alongside another hominoid species called Neanderthals. And for some reason, the, the Neanderthals died out, even though we all still have some element of Neanderthal DNA in us. And I often make the joke, if you look at my family, then it's clear that there's a lot of Neanderthal blood still going around. And I'm sure they will say the same of me. But there was two species, or most likely more than two on Earth. Homo sapiens uh, could be because of our ability to use language, our ability to think um, abstractly and so forth. We're the only humanoid species that remained. That was due to an evolutionary process. We are in the process already of creating a new species on Earth. And this time, it's not nature or evolution. Humans are creating a new species. And I'll, I'll give you some references to authors whose books uh, you should read and whose YouTube videos you should watch. We are implanting more and more devices into humans. And, and we've done that for years, if you think of pacemakers and so forth. This year, companies like Neuralink, owned by Elon Musk and others, received FDA approval in the US to implant digital devices into human brains. We call it the brain-computer interface. Up until recently, these devices were tested on animals, predominantly on pigs. Now they're starting to test it on humans. And again, neutral technology, it can go both ways. The potential medical benefits are vast if we think of people suffering from Alzheimer's and other diseases, or even people who have lost their sight or their hearing. There's a potential that we can hardwire the brain to get some of those capabilities back. But think of the other side. What if you can read my thoughts through an implant, but even more dangerously, what if you can influence my thoughts? What if you make me and millions of people think the way you want me to think? That's the danger. Now, if you think that's not already happening, you're wrong. If you have a smartphone, it's already happening. It's just not implanted in your head. Your view of the world, how you vote, how you make decisions is hugely impacted by your social media feed. Those algorithms learn about you. What are your preferences? It could be sexual preferences. It could be political preferences. And we keep on being bombarded by news and posts and media that amplifies our already existing uh, biases. If you think you are not under constant surveillance already, you are wrong. Have you seen that when you speak about mountain biking with your mate and your phone is next to you, what is on your Facebook feed tomorrow? Mountain biking. Constantly under surveillance. I even have corporate clients who now, when they go to an in-person board meeting, they have a a wall of little lockers like you, you get in the gym. They put their phones in the locker, they lock it, and then they go into the board meeting because you don't know who's listening. Think of industrial espionage. Think of China and other countries. And if it's a virtual meeting, they are encouraged to take their phone. And two of the best places you can put your phone in this context is in the microwave or in the fridge. Just don't forget it there. But you don't know who's listening. So our thoughts are already being manipulated and being read through these smartphones that we have. So that's quite scary. And I think we, we can't be, as I said, asleep at the wheel, especially as parents, when we think about our children and about their future, the kind of world that we will leave for them. So let's look at the next poll. And then we just have one more left before I finish. Do you think AI will replace human professionals in accounting? I'm not sure. I think AI will probably be able to replace accountants, or I'm confident that there are things AI will never be able to do. And we could have changed that word accounting to almost any other job, especially knowledge kind of work. You're not sure, you think it'll most likely replace what you do, or you just think that just there's things that AI can't replace. I'd love to see what people think about that topic. So let's look a bit about the, the mystifying aspect of AI. Now, about a year ago, my father asked me, he said, Johan, what is this AI stuff that you are doing? And he's not a stupid person, but he's not a technologist. And I struggled so much to explain it to him. The reason is that we use techie terms 
AI, machine learning, Internet of Things, cloud technology, and so forth. And we throw it around so much that I think half the time we don't even know what we're talking about. But without using the terminology that me and my peers use, I was unable to explain it to him. And it really bothered me. So I gave it a lot of thought and I, dis I invented a simple way to explain it. It's very simple. And I've used it a lot in corporate training, executive training, uh, some of the academic work that I do as well. And this is how I explain it. So the question is, what is AI? And super simplified. When we as humans do work, we essentially do four main things, if you think about it. We have the ability to see and to read. So you can see an email. You can see an instruction, a client request, and so forth. You understand what you're seeing. And then we have the ability to execute a task based on what we've seen. So it could be, a again, a request for a quote. So you have to go look for, do we have stock? Is it a current customer? Can I actually compile the quote and send it off to them? We can see and we can execute. We can also understand language. Not just Zulu or Tosa or Afrikaans or English. We have the ability to understand the nuances behind what people are saying. You can pick up if somebody's frustrated or angry or even deceitful or happy. I've seen a lot of this technology being used in contact centers, it's sentiment analysis kind of technologies. So we can see, we can execute tasks, we understand language, and then lastly, we learn as humans. We learn from our mistakes, but we learn from new information. We keep on learning. And then what I typically do is those four concepts I overlay it on my slides with the following words. Computer vision. Algorithms have the ability to understand what it sees through a camera. Think of a self-driving car, for instance. A self-driving car can recognize a stop sign, but not just the stop sign. If the stop sign is in the shade, in the dark, turn on its side, flat on the road, painted green by some teenager, and so forth. And if we think of Tesla's cars and other self-driving cars, what makes it amazing is that these learnings through what they see algorithmically is then uploaded to all the cars across the world. That's what makes it so amazing. We think of optical character recognition, a technology that's been there for many, many years. But these days, it's not just extracting information from a document, but understanding what the document says. And I'll give you a practical example shortly. So our algorithms can see and understand what they see. Think of facial recognition and biometric recognition, for instance. Secondly, just like humans, algorithms can then execute tasks actually do the work that it was instructed to do. And here we speak about smart automation, robotic process automation, and the like. And then natural language understanding, or some people say natural language processing. If you use Siri on your iPhone, if you have an Alexa device, if you have a Google Home, these devices are these days so smart in recognizing what you're saying. Now, some of you might remember, I reckon it must be 20 years ago or so, there was a, a software platform called Dragon Dictate. You ordered it, you received the box. I think it was a number of floppy disks or CDs. If you're young, you might have no idea what I'm talking about. But then you had to spend five to six hours training it. So it'll give you documents and documents to read so that the software can learn your way of expressing the nuances around your language and so forth. And even then, it still struggled if, when you dictated a letter, for instance, to, to write it accurately. These days, unless you have a really bad accent or you speak in a really funny way, most algorithms will pick up what you're saying. Use, uh, if you use Google Docs in Chrome as a browser, and there's an option where you can click transcription, it is amazing how accurate it does it and how quickly it does it. So computers can also see computer vision. Computers can automate and execute tasks, automation understand languages and the nuances around languages, sentiment analysis, uh, natural language understanding, and then learning. And this is where machine learning comes in. The ability for software systems to keep on improving itself based on its interaction with the outside world, the information it receives, it sends out, and it, if depending on how we program it, it keeps on getting better and better at what it's doing. 
So those four concepts, it can see and understand, it can automate and execute tasks, it understands languages and nuances, and it keeps on learning. Very simply put, that is AI technologies, which then brings me to this point. When is a tool an AI tool? And this is quite important for all of us in this meeting, because you will have a lot of vendors and consultants that will want to sell you a tool and on the box, it says artificial intelligence. Most of the tools that you can currently buy in the market, software tools, are not artificially intelligent tools. They are automation tools. And again, like with the previous example, there are four things to keep in mind to discover whether and decide whether the tool you're using is an AI tool. Can it predict? Because most tools can look at past data and give you a good analysis, and you as a human still have to use your expertise based on that analysis to make decisions and to execute certain things. But if the technology can take past data and very accurately predict what will happen next, market trends and so forth, it's probably a machine learning AI tool. If it gives you a great analysis on past data only, it's not artificial intelligence. And think about from an accounting point of view. And again, going back from that um, number crunches to trusted advisors, it's using this technology to help your clients, so to speak, see into the future, market trends, um, trends happening in that specific industry, and so forth. If it can self-learn, I've already alluded to it. If it's a platform that gets better by itself, it's probably an AI tool. If you or a software engineer have to fix it, repurpose it, because it's not working well in certain instances, it's not artificial intelligence. If it shows you patterns, especially patterns you did not think of asking it, it's probably AI. If it gives you answers to questions you did not ask it, it's most likely AI, not automation. Now, let's go back to the example I used. You need to write an algorithm to identify potential family units in the client database of a bank. So the ask is, identify all of our bank clients who are probably part of a family. And the algorithm can do that fairly accurately if your data is mature. But what if the insights that come back tell you things you didn't ask it for. So for instance, did you know that 80% of our clients are female and 60% of those clients are between the ages of 18 and 35? And looking at our data, about 50% of them are most likely mothers if we look at their spending patterns and what they are spending money on. From an ethnicity point of view or a geographical location point of view, these are the trends. So it recognizes patterns from data and it answers questions that you might not have asked it. So let me recap that. Very simply put, when is an AI, when is a tool most probably an AI tool? If it can predict the future quite accurately, if it self-learns, self-improves over time, if it shows you patterns and it gives you answers to questions you didn't ask. Now, I'm very excited. Today, on the 1st of November, Microsoft is finally releasing Copilot to their enterprise customers. Now, I'm not an enterprise customer, so I still can't use it. Most of you might know about it. Amazing demos on YouTube and other platforms where they're using ChatGPT or OpenAI technologies, because remember, a, uh, Microsoft has got a $10 billion investment in OpenAI. And in their office suite within Office 365, you can start bringing in some of these large language model capabilities. And if you've seen the demos, for instance, you might have a PowerPoint presentation open and you can type in prompt like you do with ChatGPT or BARD, change the background of all the slides to green, and it does it. Change the text to this font, move all the text to the bottom left, and so forth, and so forth. The ability for it to to determine what you're trying to say in a Word document, for instance. The, the ability to look at the most likely email response. You can, for instance, ask it, give me a view of my eight most important emails of the last week. And looking at all the data on the emails, all the past interactions of the emails, it will bring that view up.
one of the problems we all have, because there's sometimes so many historical emails on one topic, that you have to now go and read through all of them again three months later. You can ask Copilot, just give me a summary of what uh, this email trail is about in two sentences, and it brings it up. So from a productivity point of view, from an insights point of view, it's amazing. Microsoft is not the only ones doing it. But again, patterns, predictions, giving us answers. What did ChatGPT do to the world? It brought us from an era of simply searching to answers. Think of this. If you do a Google search, you don't receive the answer. You receive homework. Because Google will give you the most probable websites that contain the information you're looking for. And the algorithms are very accurate. But I still need to click on that link, whether it's a news report or, a, or, a, or some sort of other document, and go and look at the information. So for instance, if you do a Google search on the Rugby World Cup, it will give you the Rugby World Cup, maybe Supersport and a few other links, maybe News24, and you still have to go into those links and try and find the answer. But with Google's Bard and especially uh, Microsoft Bing in the Edge browser, we're getting to a point now where not only will the, will the search engine give you the, the probable links, it will attempt answering the question. So, and, and I use only Microsoft's Bing at the moment. I don't use ChatGPT anymore, even though it's the same baseline technology because in, in Microsoft, it gives you the most recent data. You can prompt it and say, who are the winners of the Rugby World Cup? And it will bring it up. You can ask it, what is the result of last night's cricket game? And remember, it's not always 100% accurate, but it's pretty accurate, and it also gives you references. Where did it find this information? So let me give you a use case. We talk about large language models, and this is a use case I worked um, on with a bank fairly recently. Say I want to take paternity leave in January. I need to do a number of things. Firstly, I need to find our company's leave policy. Now, if you've worked for, or if you're working for a large corporate, you will know finding a policy can take you a day uh, if you're lucky enough to find it. So I need to find out what is our company's policy on leave and on paternity leave. I need to look at what does the labor law say around paternity leave. I need to look at how many leave days will I have left in January if I don't take any annual leave between now and then. Will there be any public holidays that I need to take into account? And Am I maybe booked to a customer project in that time already? So now I'm going to spend a number of hours and I'm going to have to access eight or nine or six or seven different platforms searching. Now, a lot of the clients I work with are busy using technology, existing technology, and you find this within some of Microsoft tools, some of uh, Amazon's AWS tools and others, where we build a ring-fenced large language model in our business. Again, with ChatGPT and BARD, you can put in the prompt. You don't know where that data is going. But those tools are amazing. If you copy and paste the spreadsheet into ChatGPT and you ask for an analysis, it is incredible what it does. Where does that information go? We've already had three or four serious data breaches with ChatGPT over the last year. You can't put client identifiable and personally identifiable information into these platforms, even though they are free. But imagine you can build a large language model within your business. The maturity of your data and the accessibility of your data is important. But imagine in this case that I've just mentioned, I prompt an internal system. I want to take paternity leave in January, tell me about it. And it starts pulling data from all the systems and it actually gives me an answer, not homework. So the answer might be, Johan, we, uh, the labor law says paternity leave a minimum of five days. Our company policy is seven days. If you don't take any annual leave between now and then, you will have four extra days to consume. Remember that that Monday is a public holiday. And also remember you've been booked to that project. Can I automatically set up a meeting with your line manager to discuss it? Think how it will change the world of work if we can so easily access meaningful answers to our questions. Now imagine from an accounting point of view, you have a myriad of spreadsheets and sources of client data. You have to use your experience and you have to use your colleagues to find meaning in that data. What if you can use technology like this to say, if you look at these say this five gigabytes worth of transactional data over the last X number of years. Give me some of the insights. 
Give me answers to questions I might not have considered asking you. The power in our hands. But then where does that leave us if the technology can do that? Will it make us trusted advisors? Do we have not only the accounting and financial experience, but do we have the business acumen? I mean, if the bots can do the stuff we've been doing, what do we need? Do we have that ability, that um, emotional intelligence, uh, the ability to sit in front of a customer, look him or her in the eyes with empathy, help them and guide them? if the robots can do the stuff we've been doing. A good friend of mine who is a cancer researcher said the following, and I always think about it. She said that AI will not replace doctors, but AI will replace doctors who don't use AI. Now let's bring it to the context of today. AI will not replace financial professionals or accountants who use AI. But if you don't, if you don't know where to start, if you're not familiar with the technology, then you stand a chance of becoming redundant in the foreseeable future. Now, does that mean you have to become an AI expert, a coder? Uh, do you need to use Python to program AI? Of course not. Start with understanding what it is. You have to self-study. There's so much available freely online through uh, Udemy, uh, although it's always free, but even on YouTube, although you have to use your mind and see what is the fluff and what's real. Start by understanding the terminology. There are about 80 or 90 different terms related to AI technologies. You don't have to know all of them, but when a client or a colleague or a vendor speaks about machine learning um, or the internet of things and data from uh, devices or cloud computing, understand at least in a basic way what it is all about. Now, I'm almost done and then I'd love to see those questions or comments. So. I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, and it's called Take the Robot Out of the Human. And then just before I conclude, we're going to have a look at our third poll. It's a piece of work I did when I was still with an audit firm two years ago with one of our large banks and their professional banking team. And we came up with a, a pyramid a picture, and we divided it into three. And um, what we said is in any job that you do, you have very kind of low level administrative reporting tasks. You have more uh, uh, difficult, perhaps more digital kind of tasks. And then at the top of the pyramid is the category of things that only you can do, that technology can't do. And the idea behind automation is how do we take people from wherever they are on that pyramid and bring them up to the place where we focus more and more on things that only humans can do? and the things that only humans want to do. And, and we really got these bankers excited because you know a lot of them, when we started that event, sat there looking, leaning back, arms crossed, thinking, what are these consultants gonna tell us? Because they thought that the message was gonna be that AI can do your job. But the message was, let, let AI and the robots and the algorithms do the stuff you don't wanna do, scheduling the meetings, getting the insights from the data, administrative reporting kind of work, and get to a point where you have more face time with your clients. An exercise I often do with my clients, I say, if you can draw a pie chart on your current daily allocation of work, what would it look like? So how much time are you spending traveling or setting up meetings or looking at reports? And how much of that is actually quality time, thinking time, planning time, client time? And then the second pie chart is what is your ideal? And it has to be realistic. So for a lot of people, it would be more time in front of a client, but with the backup of insights that makes me a trusted advisor. And then you build an automation strategy over certain period milestones. How do we take you from where you are now to where you should be doing? How do we take the robot out of the human? You don't have to fear robots. If what you do is repetitive, you are already a robot. Let the robots do it. Let those things that only you can do from your experience be done by you. So before I finish, let's just briefly look at poll number three. How will the role of accountants change into the future? Again, three options, not much. The basic need and role for accountants will stay the same. Number two, technology will allow us to become trusted advisors based on data. And then lastly, chat GPT and related technologies will be the accountants of tomorrow. So let me just quickly summarize before we look at some of the questions and comments. AI technology is hugely misunderstood. 
it's not as powerful or dangerous yet as Hollywood makes us think it is. If we can understand it in simple terms. We have to educate ourselves and we have to determine what are those things that the technology can do much better than we will ever be able to do and let it do it. And let's focus on the things that only we can do. We have to take the fear out of this technology and we have to educate ourselves, even though we don't necessarily have to become experts. And with that, uh, Lihana, love to hear what questions or comments there might be before we uh, end the session. Thank you so much, Johan. What a great session. Um, you know, for me personally, artificial intelligence um, is just, I've, I've really embraced it. I find it very interesting, a little bit scary because of the uncertain, but it's not something that I have a fear of. Um, the SIPAP members know me very well. English is not my first language. And one of the things that I use chat GPT so often for is I do a write-up of a piece, I put my own work, I put it in chat GPT, and then I say, please help me make this a little bit more professional, make it a little bit more funny, um, check the grammar, and then a piece of work comes out of there that looks like it's written by a journalist, and um, I'm anything but. So you can really use these tools. Jan, based on, on the questions that's come in on the chat rooms um, during your session, I can see that, that the, the delegates have really embraced and enjoyed this presentation. So one of the first questions that we've had is somebody asked, to what extent do humans take accountability when the artificial intelligence system is involved? If you can give us a little bit of feedback on that, please, Johan. It's a great question and very relevant. And sadly, we don't have any official or legal based answers. Again, let, I've alluded to it already that we don't have a regulatory framework on AI technologies anywhere in the world. The EU has made a lot of progress over the last three years in, in what they call the EU AI Act. Hopefully, it will be enacted into law over the next year. But that act, amongst many other things, addresses this question. Because you can't blame an algorithm for something that went wrong. There's still a human somewhere in that process that made the algorithm incorrect or that allowed it to do something. I spent some time with our largest bank recently with their legal team for three days. And they, they the question was, you know, the bank's bringing in more and more chatbots for financial advice, more and more AI and automation. What do we as legal professionals need to do to prepare ourselves? And the sad thing is that there's no case law available. What do you do when an AI chatbot gives incorrect financial advice? Who do you sue? Is it the bank? Is it the programmer of the algorithm? Is the vendor who installed it? And maybe another example, if a drone flies into a building and causes damage, is it the manuf manufacturer of the airframe, the pilot of the drone, the algorithm creator, and so forth? So we humans are still involved. We can't just blame that our AI made that decision. But sadly, the framework of determining where the blame lies and where the restitution lies is very unclear, and it doesn't seem that most countries, and especially our country, is doing anything about that. Uh, Jan, I hope that answers the question. Uh, Jan, it definitely does answer the question. It, it just makes me wonder. Uh, there was actually a follow-up question after you've answered, and I think you have responded to that as well. Basically, the question says, does the use of AI protect professionals against litigation? And I, I believe that you've answered that. Mm -hmm. Um, ultimately, the responsibility still lies with the professional. That That is what I understand from your yes. response. Um, Jan, do you agree? I agree. Uh, but we have to grapple with, as a business, for instance, or corporate, is who are those individuals? And what are their roles and responsibilities? Who might be to blame? And do they even know that they are at risk of being blamed for what an AI can do? So it, it opens up a can of worms that's a lot more than just what if AI goes wrong? Because if you now have to follow a disciplinary process or litigation and so forth, it, it's such murky waters. So the humans are still responsible, but getting to the bottom of who is responsible is very unclear at the moment. I believe that the professionals out there should always still recognize our, our professional behavior, our professional requirements, our ethics, mm -hmm. our knowledge, skills, expertise requirements in the service offerings that we offer our clients. 
Um, then further to that, Johan, um, will the advocacy of artificial intelligence be a threat to the accountancy and advisory profession? So I think that's the, the old age question. Is artificial intelligence a threat to this profession or not? Yeah, it's a train that is going down the road. And if you're not on it, it's going to go past you, which is the case with all technological innovations through the ages. Um, again, and uh, you know, for me, if you fear something, your ability to learn is limited. It's just human nature. But if you try and educate yourself, demystify it, get more excited, look at practically how can you use it, you'll be a lot more open to learn how you can use this technology in the right way and responsibly. If and this applies to most jobs on earth. If we don't pivot and upskill and embrace it, there is no doubt that we will be left behind. So uh, this, this, not even, this is not even a binary uh, topic. You have to make sure that you understand what you're talking about, but also how it can benefit you, not just using it because if you don't, you're going to be redundant. It can really help you as a professional. Start small. I often say, if you don't use Excel properly, don't even look at AI. The abilities of Excel, and especially now Chad GPT, who can actually show you some of those um, methods to, to extract data. Let it serve you as a professional. Let it amplify your experience. But you have to learn to use this technology because it will massively and drastically change all industries in the world. And not in 50 years, in the next five years, I think. Thank you so much, um, Johan. So my understanding is that AI is not going to replace you and it shouldn't be a threat as long as you stay with the times, as long as you develop and learn and change and adapt and be agile towards artificial intelligence. Um, now that we have determined that we shouldn't be scared of it, it's not going to replace us. How can artificial intelligence fast track the agility and transformation of the accountancy professionals? I think it applies to what happens in all businesses. Because the, the, the basics of any business includes functions like finance, but maybe HR, legal, uh, procurement, and so forth. And then on top of that, there's the speciality layer of you're a construction firm or an audit firm, etc. I think start with what can make life better for you? What can do the, how can technology do the heavy lifting? Especially when it comes to reporting, it could even be compliance um, and so forth. It could be you're on a recruitment drive, as assessing a thousand resumes and so forth. So identify in your core business areas, the places where smart technology, and it might not even be AI, or just digitization or automation can help you. Uh, Lian, I hope that answers the question, but I think it, and again, remember that bring the printer closer, the common sense approach to making life better for you and your staff, which may or may not include tech or even AI. Thanks so much, Jan. I do believe us, and I'm saying us because I think it's, it's all, of, all of us humans, a majority of us, try to complicate it too much. You know, so if we if we read AI or hear AI, we think of some fancy equipment or machine or investment that I have to do. So based on that, we've received a, a question on the chat box which said, is anyone aware of an AI or app that a business can use to record minutes of a meeting? So the person specifically asked that not interested at this point to, to discuss the confidentiality aspect that they recognize all of that. Mm. But as I was reading this question, I was thinking, um, basic, and, and again, this is not my level of expertise at all, but Teams, mm. Zooms, Word that dictate, um, it's, it's things that we already have on our machines. It's things that is available to us. So, um, Johan, do you agree, disagree with my, um, with my comment and statement? I fully um, agree, uh, Liana. Sorry, yeah, the technology has been around for a long time. The trick is to integrate it because to just have, for instance, an audio recording or maybe a, an AI transcribed document on that meeting somewhere is not going to help you. Again, I go back to Microsoft, but other platforms are doing it within Teams. And again, now with, with Auto or Copilot, not only can you have that meeting captured and transcribed, 
but you can also let the system allocate tasks and timelines to you and your team based on executing what you agreed on in the meeting. And if you store it all on your OneDrive and you want to reply to a future email, one of the things that the large language model will do is to reference those meeting notes and other meeting notes to make sure that you don't forget it. Because we, I mean, I forget after half an hour what was discussed in a meeting. So the tech is already there. Most delegates on the call right now probably have the right licensing from a Microsoft point of view, et cetera. But the tech is there. Just make sure it's integrated and you can use it for other things than just storing it for in case you need it in the future. Thanks so much, Jan. It's a delegates while while Johan is answering, I'm going through the questions. And it's just amazing to see how people are, are commenting and the questions that everyone is adding to this. Johan, now comes the age all and in our profession, always one of the most important points. Ethics. How do we bring together artificial intelligence, the use of it in our businesses, implementing in our businesses, relying on it, but still having our input and ethics. So, I mean, we, we know about the, the examples out there that, that is always prominent. So, for example, don't let chat GPT write your answer paper to your exam. That's not ethically. But I think there's much broader issues. So um, if you can just share a, a few concerns and how you believe these can be mitigated and deal, dealt with in a business, in a professional environment, um, with specific emphasis on, on ethics around artificial intelligence. Yes. Yeah, it's almost a question of when you, as delegates, when you wake up tomorrow, what do you do based on this AI talk, I think? At, you know, it's firstly realized that for many of you in this meeting at the moment, you might not need AI yet. And I'm one of the few people who will say it to you because especially if, if your consultant or your vendor's uh, income is from licensing or implementation, they're going to want you to AI everything. There's a good chance that not everyone currently uh, with us and their businesses for now need AI technologies. Take a breath and step back. Forget about the tech and think from a business challenge and a business strategy point of view. An exercise that I love to do with my clients, because remember, they'll bring me in with the question of help us to use AI. And then I'll ask them for the next hour, let's agree not to use any technical terms. No AI, machine learning, none of that. Let's talk about what you want to achieve. In most meetings, they really struggle because they already made up their minds that AI is the answer. And, and it's not. Because the basic things, the basic processes, they're not getting right. So I would encourage people, don't consider AI as such as an answer. Think about working smarter, which might be tech or not tech. Again, the printer being brought closer. And then look at your current technologies that you have. And Excel, again, is a great example if you use it correctly. But forget about the technology and AI. What are those things that, if you get it right, will rapidly change your business now and into the future? It might be technology, but it might not be. Later on, you can look at what we call a data or an AI strategy. Most of these are fairly easily available online, or, or there are consultants that can help you. You can have to look at, do you have the right data? Do you use it? Can you use the data responsibly? Because you can't just use client data because you have it. Popia dictates that, for instance. But yeah, maybe just to summarize, it's actually quite a long answer potentially, Liana, but think of what you want to fix. What would be a game changer for your business? It might be a technology, but it might not be. That's where I would start. Thanks so much, Johan. I think it's, uh, it's quite refreshing coming from an artificial intelligence expert as yourself that is even saying, take a step back, go back to the basics. Um, what you might want to fix in your business, in your practice, is not necessarily AI. It might be, but it is not necessarily. Um, I wanted to ask you on a few final thoughts, but I think that that last uh, bit that you gave us is, is what our members is definitely going to take forward after this session. Jan, from a SIPA um, point of view and from SIPA team, thank you so much for joining us at the Accounting in Doba. It was an honor and a privilege to have you. Um, you've given us some great insights and um, we really appreciate your words. I'm going to give you a clap and I'm sure everyone at home is going to join me in. Thanks so much, Joanne. <laughs>